Aloha, my little nerdy cuddle, cuddle buddies. I'm the Salawag, and I'm not doing this for sex appeal or showing off my tattoo for any particular reason. But I just saw The Sandman on Netflix, and it was very, very good. So, check it out. I'm going to go back to sleep now and watch more episodes. <clears throat> Oh, it's just sand, man. Oh. Mm. Oh. Where are you going to put your sand now? Oh. Ooh. Didn't think you'd fit there. Hello, hunters, and welcome back to another episode of the Salawogs Why It's Great Gut Reaction. Uh, yes, I'm shirtless again, and I'm in my bed again. You see, I did not do a census or a peer-reviewed study, nor did I do any research at all, but I just felt like you guys love me when I'm shirtless, so I'm here again. Because this particular review is about a show about a guy who puts you to sleep. And I thought... I'm in bed already. I'm as comfortable as it's going to get in the winter time. Oh, yeah. With my $10 pillow and my $4 pillow from Target. Uh, it's so comfy in here. So, for those of you who don't have a bed, I'm sorry. But for those who do, maybe watch this review in bed. Yay! So... I gotta say, I did no research at all for this show because I just finished watching it last night and I just, it's called Gut Reaction, which means most of the time I won't do any research, but here's the information in this troll scroll, or if there's no information, it's because I'm lazy. Uh, but yeah, I gotta say, Sandman was awesome. Uh, if, if you're looking for a very beautifully written, well, well shot, well directed, well casted show, Sandman is, is your guy. Um, the main actor who plays Sandman, uh, not only does he look like a comic book drawing uh, or some kind of uh, painting type of... He, he, that's what kind of what he looks like, like some kind of Renaissance painting of what the Sandman is supposed to look like. I never read any of the Neil Gaiman comics or, or books that this is based off of, so... Uh, I was happy to see he's part of the development of the show, along with David Goyer, who David Goyer is involved with some of the most successful and true to the comics material we've had in comic book movies in the last 20 years. So I'm hoping this is faithful to the show, I, I, that's the, the books, and with Neil Gaiman involved, I'm hoping it's faithful. Oh, Band-Aid, uh, cut myself at work. Yeah, I know it adds to my sex appeal. This is really for the... This shirtlessness is for the ladies, and for the gents, and for the she, him, they, them, they, their, thars that are out there. Thar. I'm sure thar is next. Because, you know, you can't stop at they. You must evolve the human language to thar. I am not a thar. I'm a him. I'm a dude. I'm a dude. Look, look at the laziness of this show. I'm a dude. But yeah, Sandman was incredible. Uh, without spoiling too much, just for those who don't know what the Sandman is. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Uh, so the Sandman in mythology is... Uh, is a mythologi mythological character who puts, essentially puts you to sleep and... Puts you, puts you, puts you to sleep, scissors. He puts you to sleep, scissors. Uh, he puts you to sleep, and he gives you dreams or nightmares, and I don't really know much more beyond that. Actually, this was a great study in what the heck a Sandman is. So, um, oh, oh. No, that's for my OnlyFans. You don't get to see that. No. Uh, I'm not on OnlyFans. Uh, but so essentially, the show is about the Sandman, who is an endless, whatever that is, it's a, maybe a little bit more powerful than a god, It's or about as powerful as a god, it's a bit unclear. But the Sandman, the ruler of dreams and nightmares, actually gets 
kidnapped by a, a human wizard essentially trying to cast a spell to bring death over to the land of the living in order to bring his son back from the dead. And instead of capturing death, he captures the Sandman. And assuming that the Sandman is death, keeps him uh, in, in caged uh, for over a century, trying to get him to agree to bring his son back not knowing that he's actually the master of dreams, not death. But Sandman, f having no real respect for humans or, or interest in making any bargains, and certainly feeling that it would do him no good, just says nothing. So we see the consequences of a world where humans cannot dream. And uh, uh, there's sleep sicknesses and all types of consequences to the lack of a sandman running things in our dreamscape in our collective unconscious uh but eventually he does get out and his mission for the majority of the season is to uh, collect his things he came with a, a helmet and a couple other important items that are part of his his function of his job as the sandman it's actually a job that he performs as an endless entity uh, and it's a, it's a really cool show. Uh, we got some really great characters. Uh, Professor Lupin from the Harry Potter movies is in this is in this show. And, you know, casting like that really levels up the show for how how strong of a cast it is. Tywin Lannister is the mage who captures the Sandman in the beginning. A lot of really fantastic actors. Tywin Lannister from Game of Thrones. For those of you who are like, hey, I recognize that name. What show? Game of Thrones. I know him as the marksman from Last Action Hero. So it's really like every time I see him, I'm like, oh, you're the guy from Last Action Hero. You're the guy from Last Action Hero. Yeah. What a great villain. What a... If you haven't seen Last Action Hero and you love Tywin Lannister from Game of Thrones, check that out. It's He's probably... He must be in his... his 30s in that movie i think um but he plays a really he plays a henchman who it's it's one of those reveals where he's actually the real villain of the movie as opposed to just being the henchman i love those kind of little twists uh but yeah i really love the cast of sandman uh, like i said the the main actor who plays sandman is is fantastic he has that perfect dreary voice that feels like it could put you to sleep but kind of doesn't and also kind of gives me vision vibes like if if we didn't have the excellent actor who plays vision maybe this guy would have played vision uh but you know that that's that's the quality that this guy brings to the sandman role this dreary voice of intrigue and could also put you to sleep because he's the sun man uh yeah and that's why i'm doing this in my bed because uh, this podcast hopefully will put you to sleep because uh, you're on autoplay and that's what, how you got here most likely. Uh, but also, damn, you know, Sandman, so beautiful. And uh, I, I really thought the writing was very good. I thought the writing was really... Uh, it, it didn't try to be too deep, uh, even though it did kind of go in that direction here and there. I always felt like... It was doing it through character. I think the worst type of writing is sometimes even in the best of shows like Walking Dead, where in Walking Dead, especially in the later seasons, we get this constant let's stop and have regular conversations with kind of deep metaphorical meanings. And I, I think that that really gets old, especially on an audience after a while. It's like, okay you're just literally on the nose saying that this is about violence and self-control and all this stuff. And it's just like, what are you interested in today? Like what's going on with you? Like that's the character stuff. And, uh, there's a particular episode, uh, professor Lupin from Harry Potter is in this show as this kind of demented lost son of Tywin Lannister. I'm mess of the mage of the mage. I'm sorry. Just to make it more clear, he's not actually from Game of Thrones, but he's the lost son of the mage who captures Sandman. 
and he in his youth because sandman was captured for a hundred years in his youth got this jewel that the sandman uses to make dreams a reality and he abused this power and the abuse of that power uh, is what gets him locked up and essentially he gets free and he has his own little episode of just being free and manipulating this little diner full of regulars and the that particular episode at first it's a little corny it's a, it almost feels a little college like in in the writing but when we get to the end of that episode and the consequences and you kind of see his mentality and the way he manipulates scenarios um that he himself has a struggle with differentiating sort of his manipulation and perspective of reality versus reality itself and when the sandman confronts him that conflict and you see sandman's point of view it's fascinating it really it's one of those things where you have like four or five episodes of the sandman on this journey but he's not saying very much uh but he has a perspective but this little conflict with professor lupin is where we kind of understand Sandman's point of view and very much the second half of the show is about Sandman's point of view on his job and on why, why he does things the way he does things. And it's cool that the fact that we get all these beautiful visions and all these, because we go into the dreamscape, we see amazing landscapes that are, are surreal or unreal. We have all these fun little characters who are dealing with their dreams and what the dreams mean to them. Uh, and not that at any point are you asking for it, but when you do get the Sandman's point of view, it's worth it. It's like, oh, this is how you see things. This is why you do things this way. Uh, the, you know, the establishment by the end of the season of what these rules are actually supposed to be there for uh it's it's fascinating it's a, it's a really interesting show it's an interesting breakdown on uh whether you believe a sandman exists or not the function of our dreams it's a really it's really interesting and uh yeah i just thought damn what, what a beautifully done show it's 11 episodes so there's about 10 episodes of solid story we meet de uh, the devil lucifer um, and Luke, that's awesome. That's also, uh, I forget her name. Uh, I forget her real name and her name in Game of Thrones. She's also from Game of Thrones. Uh, so you see they're pulling from, from really quality, uh, actor pool here. Uh, I loved, I think it's Gwendolyn. Ah, I forget her last name. Uh, but she plays the woman knight, the lady knight from Game of Thrones, and she's fantastic as Lucifer. There's uh, so many great cast members, but I really love seeing her as Lucifer for her. that one. There's one particular episode that centers around her, and and it's a battle between Lucifer and the Sandman. And I really was impressed by how they they didn't do a literal battle so this is a little bit of a spoiler but it's a battle of ideas and there are physical consequences but that that was really cool where she says i am a wolf and it's almost like their battles in their minds between each other because we go into the darkness and we see a wolf and then he says i am a huntsman and as each one names what they are there's like an attack that occurs sort of internally on the other person. So seeing scar, seeing a slash just randomly appear on Sandman's face and then seeing like a cut appear on Lucifer's face and then uh, seeing them back. That was a very interesting episode. I was like, wow, uh, everything leading up to it and the event itself. I thought that was really cool. Uh, there's so many great things in... Sandman uh, it's just worth mentioning some of these things if it helps you to get to watch it because I don't want to spoil this this episode this show for you uh, the point of gut reaction is not necessarily to break it all down sometimes I just really want you to know 
that you should go check something out. It would be better just to watch the thing for you if you have access to Netflix or you can watch it illegally online somewhere. Not that I'm recommending it, but you know, if, if you can watch it online somewhere or use your friend's account or whatever, uh, sometimes it's just better to watch the thing. I think you would get so much more from watching Sandman than from watching anyone's breakdown. Because sure, someone could break it all down for you and explain it for you. But in the case of the Sandman, it's trying to reach through you. It's not trying to didactically spell something out for you. And so I feel that the meaning of the show would be diminished if I tried to explain the show to you and try to do some deeper breakdown of it. Watch the show, and actually, I would like to know what you think in the comments uh, of each episode, or, or is there a particular episode that hits you personally? Because I'll tell you, for me, I think the episode that hit me the most personally was the diner episode. So if you get to that episode and it hits you in any way personally, what I'll tell you, uh, my, my only real spoiler for that episode is that there's a character who is a waitress, and she tries to be positive all the time. And essentially, Professor Lupin uses, misuses his powers to kind of get her to be more honest and bring out her darker side. And not that all aspects of her that were something I relate to, but I do relate to that kind of need to put this face over yourself and sort of punch through, punch through your regular day job because she has a dream of being a writer. I, too, have a dream of being a filmmaker. And uh, not that I haven't explored that dream to some extent, but here I am podcasting instead. Uh, but that's essentially what I felt. I was like, wow, I really feel... Although the episode in its beginning, I think, is a little... It feels a bit meandering, but once it gets to the payoffs of what it's building up to, the diner episode, I think hits home the most personally for me because of all of the ways it exacts both good and dark fantasies and definitely by episodes end, I, I felt like I related the most to the Sandman that and the following episode uh, where Sandman actually meets death and they have a conversation. Uh, I love that whole. So, so I think that's episodes four and five. Uh, but those two episodes I related to and loved the most and I would like to know, just, let's just talk. I, I don't care if you like my podcast. I don't care. Uh, but if you would like to talk about the show, please leave me a comment saying uh, what your favorite episode was. Maybe we can talk about that. Or just tell me, yeah, just tell me what your favorite episode is, even if that's all you have to say. Uh, but if you want to discuss some aspects of the show, hey, let's have a conversation in the comments. I'm more interested in that. Uh, I don't need any smoke blown up my butt because I'm just sitting here in my bed talking to you. Uh, but I'd really love to know what you guys think about the show. How does it make you think about your dreams? Um, I'm very curious about that. And I'm really hoping that, uh, Comic Book Girl 19, aka Danica now, does some kind of video on this show because her kind of analysis, that's the kind of analysis I would be interested in watching here on YouTube. But for those of you who are just interested in Sandman and you're like, ah, you know, I'm a thicker uh pudgy kind of funny human being and and is there another thick kind of pudgy kind of funny human being out there what would they think of sandman and i i say i like it it's it's double thumbs up for me uh marcus aurelius is definitely saying yay let this one live i thought sandman was beautiful beautifully well written it's 11 episodes total 10 episodes of official story what I love is that the 11th episode is kind of a bonus. It's kind of a two episode in one where we get a half hour of one story and a half hour of another. I really like that. There's a story of cats and a story of Calliope in episode 11. I really loved uh, the story of Calliope. I think uh, that particular half I would love more of if they do a season two. Not specifically of that scenario, but just stories like that. Uh, of that particular kind of, of conflict where it ties to the Sandman, but the Sandman is not necessarily the central character. I really liked stuff like that. Because they gave us 10 great episodes, I like that we can have this kind of bonus where 
Sandman's not the main character, but he's still an important aspect of the episode. So definitely check out all of Sandman. You you got to watch it. If you, if you like it, it's a little bit slower, but it's really well written, really well performed, great cinematography, great effects, great production design. It's hitting tens on every level. Great costumes. I really love Sandman's full costume. He looks so freaky. Um, but his hairdo is kind of like a kind of a lazy David boy who just woke up from bed. Kind of a bedhead kind of hair. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, but fitting because he is he's a, the guy who's putting you to sleep. So his hair always kind of looks like bedhead, which is nice. Although you never see him sleep. He, yeah, I just love the bedhead hair. Uh, but yeah, Sandman is excellent. Go check it out. Uh, and while I'm being lazy, I just watched Between Two Ferns, the movie. So, bah! this is a double review. I'm doing Sandman and Between Two Ferns, the movie. They have nothing to do with each other except the complete opposite quality. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was literally in bed watching between two ferns of the movie and it occurred to me i should do both of these together because they have nothing to do with each other but everything to do with me uh between two ferns the movie i i have friends who've showed me clips of between two ferns and i thought what is this sack alfanakis you mofo you doing some weird stuff you doing some weird goofy stuff and I watched Between Two Ferns, and it starts off with Matthew McConaughey being very upfront uncomfortable with Zach Galifianakis, and he's doing these very crummy, what I would say is it's the troll angry commenters comments that he gives to these actors, and you see the, the way they take it. Uh, so everyone who's ever had a negative thought about these actors is basically what Zach Galifianakis is coming at them with. Um, but in, in a very obviously comedic way, I mean, the, the, my whole thing is the, this, this movie is about this guy doing these interviews. Zach Galifianakis is playing a version of himself who wants to be a TV show guy, a, like David Letterman. Uh, but he hates his guests and he, he himself is the negative audience member who has all these very lowbrow, you know, low gut hitting thoughts about these actors. And that's his questions about them is that, uh, what's it like to be considered a bimbo Tom Cruise or not? Uh, what's it like to be considered a, a dumbass Keanu Reeves? It's like, wow, you know, uh, so many things like that that are just like if you're a fan of the actor it's like hey don't you dare say that but if you've heard people say it or if you've thought that then Zach Galifianakis is saying that in this show it's it's like this really weird negative comedy outlet for those opinions about these people uh in a fun way for the I guess the actor to kind of deal with it without dealing with it because it's Zach Galifianakis he's ultimately playing the biggest doofus of the show because how could you have a su successful show doing this to actors and people like that but uh but that's the whole gag so it's a whole movie about him trying to do his show and it's okay you know it's an okay movie but it was also it was worth sitting through it um, it has uh almost tommy boy vibes if tommy boy chris farley was an unlikable ass as opposed to being a hilariously likable ass and that's essentially what Zach Alphanakis is playing deliberately his character is supposed to be unlikable but uh my real comment on the movie is that there's bloopers that play alongside the uh, credits of the movie because you know Will Ferrell's in this movie where he's playing a version of himself being in charge of Zach Galifianakis, telling him to get 10 celebrity interviews. And there's not much to say about this movie because it's everything I described, but the bloopers that play at the end of the movie are worth getting to when you've sat through the entire movie and thought, not bad, but could have been better, you know? Not bad, 
could have been better. It was this close to being, like, hilarious. There are some bloopers that if they just left it in the movie, I'm telling you it would be a 10 for 10 movie, or at least an 8 for 10 movie, rather than a 6 or 7 kind of movie that it is. And I feel like they left those things out because they really wanted to be a focused... They wanted to focus on whatever it was they thought they were doing. But to me, the movie is so self-aware of, its, of itself that there's no reason not to have included some of those bloopers. There's at least five or ten bloopers out of the 20 bloopers they show. If they had left that in the movie, if they had let an actor crack up a couple times, because there's no way you could do... Because the, ja the, the joke is that the actors are always uncomfortable. But somebody would be laughing at some point. You know, somebody would be laughing at some point. I think the Benedict Cumberbatch scene, that's a laugh. That's an earned, honest laugh. Do you think your acting, do you think your acting would, is better because you have an English accent? That's an honest laugh. That would get a laugh out of somebody. Um, there's places like that. I think this movie could have been so much better if it stopped trying so hard to be a movie and just allowed itself just literally five of those bloopers five of those bloopers would have raised this movie up because it has a lot of potential it's just trying too hard it's taking itself too seriously by sticking to this oh zach galifianakis makes everyone uncomfortable seriously if they put those bloopers five of those bloopers in the movie I think one of the Brie Larson ones, the uh, definitely some of the Benedict Cumberbatch ones, uh, some of uh, Let the Other Guy Be Funny, some of the jokes that Paul Rudd throws at Zach Galifianakis. There's, there's five solid moments where you could have still had Zach Galifianakis edited to be serious, but the other guy is being funny. Uh... If that had been left in, this would have been a much better movie. Because it's it's just trying too hard to do what it's doing. And it's like, yeah, I remember, it's still a movie. People know that it's a movie. If, you know, one of the beautiful... This is more of a teaching moment, I feel like. Whereas Sandman is beautiful and perfect that I really... I. I would have to talk to someone who's watched it already to find the points where it could be adjusted. I really don't know off the top of my head. Like, Sandman is 10 for 10. Uh, Between Two Ferns is 6 for 10. They're 6.5 out of 10. But totally, I still recommend it because of uh, some of the good moments it has. Uh, like, there's a sequence where a pipe bursts and the water fills up. And that's when you realize it's not really a, a mockumentary. It's it's kind of a movie. That's the, another thing the movie couldn't decide, whether it was a mockumentary or a real movie. And I think it just needed to pick earlier on which one it wanted to be. But because it has this mockumentary style, it loses a lot by leaving out some of the bloopers. Uh... Because, like, look, if the writing ain't there, and you're doing all this improv shit, then let the bloopers ride, man. Let the, let, let the audience have a, let the audience have a good time, you know? Like, like stop trying to tell the audience that you take yourself seriously, you know? There's a, the film, it's a film. It doesn't matter whether that's Zach Galifianakis' character. His character can be his character, but the world is still the the real world to a certain extent uh let loose a little there's a scene in the usual suspects where it's the lineup for those of you who haven't seen the usual suspects it's about five criminals who all get arrested at the same time and thrown in a lineup because they their their criminal history is uh, a particular type of hijacking and they're all very good at what they do. And they're all thrown into the same lineup. And they all have to say this one line. So that the, you know, presumably on the other side of the camera is the victim who's supposed to identify them. And they all have to say, get out of the car and give me the keys, you mother... You know, uh, excuse the language. Uh, I cuss a lot. 
but that's what each one of these guys is supposed to say. So on the lineup, they're all saying it. And at a certain point, when like the third or fourth guy, I think it's when Stephen Baldwin does it, he just, you know, everyone else tries to do it seriously. And he's just like, ah, oh, stand up, you <laughs> you know, and then everyone starts laughing. And uh, they start hitting each other, telling each other to stop laughing, just get to get through the lineup. And it's a really great moment that kind of humanizes everybody and connects all of the cast members. But that moment is a blooper. Because when they were trying to shoot it, they were sternly trying to shoot it as a very serious scene where everyone's just trying to get through the lineup and get out of there. But that blooper was just so good and it did connect the five guys in a very natural way a completely natural way that it, it made it more believable that in the very following scene when they're all in uh the jail together and they're all in a sort of communal lockup why they would start talking to each other uh that little natural moment of bonding which was happening with the cast members uh it was just so good and it let, lightened up the movie for that that moment it was it was better and more believable than if they had just had them all be serious like they were trying to do and i'm sure they tried edits where everyone was serious and it just was not interesting because the movie had so much style it has so much intrigue we it starts off with the the murder of the main character played by gabriel byrne and sort of the walking back of what led up to that murder. And he, Gabriel Byrne, is on that lineup of five men. And he, his particular character is trying to get out of the life. He's, he's been trying for five years to get out of the life. And he's only arrested because he's the usual suspect for that crime. And he is the one who the most does not want to be there in that lineup because he's trying to get out of the life. Whereas the rest of them are still uh, working criminals. But that moment of levity that makes them all laugh was a blooper. And they just edited it as, it as it naturally could play. Because they found when they were watching the movie that they liked the guys more. That it just felt natural. It's what was in the footage. And it helped them bond for the following scene. Uh, and it was a natural thing. It wasn't directed that way. The cast wasn't trying to improv. They just couldn't help but laugh because of the line was so funny. And, uh, and you know, when you're doing a movie and you're doing these lines a hundred million times for every single camera angle, at a certain point, it's not really serious anymore because you realize you've talked yourself out of the seriousness of the scene. And this is just one of those scenes where... You can't resist the laughter. and But again, there's a blooper being used in the movie. If you edit it intentionally, it doesn't feel like a blooper. It feels like it's a natural part of the movie. And to that end, that's why I'm bringing up that. Because although Between Two Ferns in no way would be... Even if it included these bloopers, would not be compared to Tommy Boy, it could have still just leveled itself up if it's just used some of the bloopers that were in the end of the movie as part of the movie. This is one of those moments where I just thought, this is a teachable moment for how to improve your own movie. Because look, the character stuff wasn't there. The character stuff was not solid enough to carry this movie. The humor, because you're picking this dour type of humor is not strong enough to maintain the entertainment value. So when you have golden bloopers, like the bloopers left in the end of the movie, I think this is a situation where, you know what? Five of those bloopers would have upped the value of this movie so much. Like, And, uh, and my biggest complaint is at the end of this movie, there's Peter Dinklage. They should have gone way further with Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage is introduced as the last celebrity that has to be interviewed. And he's got an open shirt. He's acting drunk. And they really should have just had just five solid minutes of Peter Dinklage continuing to be that way. 
because that just we really would have amped up the humor of the final moments of that movie. Because we've already been with these characters for the entire movie. It's nice to have a little break. It's just five more minutes of Peter Dinklage being that way really would have been great. Especially post-Game of Thrones. Um, and again, five you know, the, the rule of fives for this movie... Those, yeah, some of those bloopers really, if, if, if while watching the movie, would have made the highs so much higher. Uh, so they, this, I think, is a lesson for you filmmakers out there. You know, it's not a bad movie, but it could have been a much better movie. But with the addition of very little. With the addition of very little. This is what I've learned from uh, 17 years of editing. Oh my god. 18, 17 or 18, I'm not sure anymore. I've been editing since I was 15 years old in high school. And I've edited stuff where people handed me footage saying, this is all bad footage, can you make something good? And I find the good footage, and I'm like, no, there's good footage, there's just a lot of bad. Uh, or <laughs> people seriously hand me some crap footage, and I've dealt with that. And I've dealt with mostly good footage, but if it just had a little bit more... That's the thing I think people don't realize is just you can get a lot with a little. You can get a lot with very little when it comes to movies and television. You don't have to have the biggest gags like the water gag was, you know, it was a big gag, but it wasn't that funny. You know, but some of those very small bloopers like from Paul Rudd. It had they included more Paul Rudd footage and just a couple more jokes with Letterman, there is some golden stuff in there that just as you're watching the movie is what matters. It doesn't matter... It doesn't matter necessarily if you have the strongest character development, as long as you have clear-cut characters. Uh, as, it matters that as you're watching the movie, things should hit you. Uh, and they should either hit you hard or hit you soft. Well, I think one of the best gags in the movie is Zach Galifianakis hooking up with this uh, gorgeous woman I've seen on TV before. Uh, and then paying for it. That's a great gag. But leading up to that, the movie just needed a little bit more. It just needed a little bit more fire. And the truth is, if it's a docu-style comedy, fuck it. Make it good. You know what I mean? Just make it good. Don't worry about your attitude toward the movie. Those those bloopers should not have been bloopers. They should have been a part of the movie. Uh, because there's just no way, even in a hyper-real situation, where you have this asshat saying these ridiculous things, that nobody would laugh at a certain point. Or just walk out. And that's the thing, I think. The humor, in this case, should really be coming from the reaction of the other person. And I think there's just a couple of the actors there who, if you'd gone with their natural reaction, the unacted reaction, the audience reaction would be much, much higher. Uh, like Brie Larson laughing because your family named you after a cheese. I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, that's to me, that one's an either or. But certainly some of the Paul Rudd jokes should have been left in. Because it's about the experience of the movie. The movie is an experience. It's not an attitude. You know, it's not a tone. It's an experience. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's my uh, pretentious criticisms of uh, a very deliberately silly movie. Uh, but just because I felt like it could have been sillier and better. Uh, and to learn from the usual suspects, just because... The genres are totally different does not mean that they don't have similar lessons uh, because comedy is just drama in disguise, as they say, or as probably some famous person said whose name I don't know. But uh, yeah, so yeah, that's my two cents on Between Two Ferns and on The Sandman. Clearly watch The Sandman first and then watch Between Two Ferns because you need to lighten up after that shit. So, uh, thank you for watching. That's been my uh, bedtime suggestion. Thank you for seeing me shirtless again. Um, yeah. Humanity is really hitting a, a new low with podcasting, hasn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to bed now.
Tessa Thompson. Ooh, she's in between two friends too. I wonder if she's single. Ooh. Tessa Thompson. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Bring me something that I've never seen. Tessa Thompson in her Valkyrie outfit. Getting ready to meet up with me over coffee or beer. Da 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 Tinder date. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I got dance moves, Tessa. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah, check these out. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm Samoan, but I'm also white. That's why I got white guy dance moves. Awkward dancing even in my dream. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm.